We've been, uh, for several weeks, uh, looking at this little letter by Paul to the Philippians, and our series title, as you see up there, uh, is Joy, Finding It and Keeping It. Um, why, why is joy so difficult to maintain? Can we agree that it's, it's something that's out there that we struggle to hold on to? Um, if it's not way, way too late, I want to say to you as a church, uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to go on a sabbatical earlier this year. I don't know that I ever really, like, told you much about it, but, um, and and some of you were like, you you were gone? We didn't even, yeah. (laughs) But uh, um, for uh, for seven weeks, I um, got to spend a lot of extra time with my family, with the Lord, and uh, with some good friends, and one of my one of my primary prayer requests, and I think I, I did send this out in our uh, email, and many of you were praying for me about this. I just I was just praying for joy. There was a, a joy in life that was that was missing for me, or at least had had lessened um, quite a bit, and um, and it kind of I was really trying to figure out where it had gone and how to get some of that back. And, and certainly those seven weeks um, were just an awesome time. I, I've told several of you, I don't know that I've had more fun with my family than I did in those seven weeks. I mean, just the things that we got to do, uh, that I got to do one-on-one with my kids or with my kids together, with, with Beth and the kids, it was just um, awesome stuff. But there is... Um, You know, and you can probably look at at moments where you have had joy and you're just like, man, if I could just freeze this moment and stay here. I mean, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that joy-filled day be the one that you would want for Groundhog's Day? If you remember the old Bill Murray movie, the one that you could relive over and over. Um, When we look for joy, um, Brooke and I were talking about this earlier in the week. Um, and she made this comment, when we look for joy, it's often a search for something we don't have. It's, it's like we're, we're, we're reaching for something. We, we believe it's there. We don't know exactly how far it might be, but we're reaching out for it. Um, and so this series on joy it, is, it has the tagline, finding it, keeping it. And I want to just break that down. Next week, we're going to start our Advent series. And so I kind of wanted to to wrap up this Philippians series, although we haven't gone through every verse in the book of Philippians in that little four chapter letter. um, I wanted us to to consider the role of joy and rejoicing, which is mentioned uh, 12 or more times in that little letter. Um, So when we think of this uh, finding it, can we agree that there's an endless number of places that we try to find joy? And when we step back and we look at what we're trying to find, we, we have to acknowledge that it's, um, even in the midst of that pursuit, sometimes we realize this is, this is kind of silly, but we, we will chase after it anyway. It, it could be anything from a, just that big vacation, you know, if I can just make it through for just another month and then I got that vacation and, you know, you just, that's what you're holding out for. Um, it could be for that latest gadget that that electronic device that whatever they're going to talk about on the stage in apple's theater once i get that there will be joy um you know sometimes uh sometimes people will look for joy um hits of joy through some type of drug or uh, substance uh, we have prized possessions that we think if i could just get to where i could afford that buy that own that um then we think we're going to find joy in that, uh, it could be in the career. Maybe, maybe it's when I get that title, when I get those privileges, when I'm finally doing the job that I think I was meant to do, then there will be this deep joy. It could be in, a, in an ideal relationship, and a good relationship that you believe God wants you to have. And if I can just if I can solidify that relationship, if I can meet that person, or if the person I'm with, if if we could just figure out how to turn the corner in this really challenging part of our relationship, then I know as a couple, we're gonna experience joy. Sometimes it's something really personal. Um, 
is something that maybe we beat ourselves up with. If I could just have this, this particular look, this particular um, quality, this particular body shape, there would be joy. Then I could rejoice in myself. So where do you typically search for joy? Yeah, it might be something that even in your head, you're going, man, I, how many times have we going to search for that and realize it's kind of empty? But we, we keep coming back to it. Again, when we look for joy, it's often a search for something we don't have. So if finding joy is difficult, can we see how keeping joy is even that much harder? At least this is my experience. Um, you know, what may have filled you with joy yesterday, is that going to fill you with joy today? How many of us just went nuts over that first iPhone? How many of us would find joy in that first iPhone now? <laughs> Not as many. How many of you wish you could go back to a flip phone? Yeah. And you know what? In a little bit, you wouldn't find joy in that either. What you thought was going to simplify your life is still going to be just as complicated. And maybe it's not going to be as joyous as you thought. So how do we find this, keep this? Um, is this something that just boils down to personality type? And maybe you just kind of, you, you know people who have tasted this joy and who for the most part live a consistent life of joy. And you just figure, oh, it's, it's one of those people, you know, that you want to be like, but that kind of irk you at the same time. You know, those are the people that are, has, uh, that, that are glass half full, and then you've got the other people that are glass half empty, and then you've got people like myself, glass half full of poison, and, uh, you know, just those really melancholy types is what we're talking about. Um, so is, is that what it is? Is it just, you know, some of us are wired for joy and some of us aren't? Um, are we even striving for something that God wants us to have here on this earth? Are we intended to not really have joy here so that we long for heaven that much more? So these are a lot of thoughts that go through my head. And, um, and I think that, that our search for joy, as exhausting as it is, I want, us, I want you to know that, that God in his essence is joy. And you were created in the image of your um, of him who is joy. He wants us to experience joy. He wants us to find joy here on this earth, and he wants us to maintain a life of joy. In fact, a lot of times when I read, especially in the New Testament, I think it was that joy that was drawing a lost world to Christ. They saw something in those early Christians that they wanted the way they loved each other, the way that they had joy in spite of circumstances. It was a magnetic draw to this life with Christ. But the Bible tells me that joy is available. I'm gonna keep coming back to that as my home base. If I come back to experience, I'm, I'm hopeless. If I come back to just my feelings, not a lot of hope in that, but if I come back to what the Bible says about joy, then I, I find that there is um, the joy is possible. Psalm 1611, the psalmist says, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Not just a taste of joy. There is fullness found in the presence of God. So, so I think of that and I think, okay, if it's found in the presence of God, then where is the presence of God? I want to go to wherever that is, right? Well, the psalmist also says in Psalm 139, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. Joy is found in God's presence. And guess where God's presence is? Everywhere. So if God is everywhere... <laughs> If God is around me, why am I still struggling sometimes to find joy and to maintain that joy? And not only is God's presence of joy around me, listen to this in John 15. These are the words of Jesus. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. 
Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So we're not talking about just any old joy. We're talking about the joy of Jesus, not just out there around us. It's in us. Feel free to smile at this point, okay? This is a good thing. Now, you might still be like me going, okay, if it's all around me and it's in me, then what is the disconnect that I'm feeling? So here's what I want to spend the next few minutes talking about. Um, I want to talk to you about three ways to find joy and one way to keep it. Three ways to find joy and one way to keep it. And this, this began, this, um, this, uh, this kind of quest for joy began looking at these 12 plus instances of the use joy or rejoice in Paul's letter to the Philippians. And so I began, after I counted them up, I was observing the context around the times that those words were used. And um, as I looked at those, then I began to kind of expand my search. How was joy and rejoicing used throughout the New Testament? How was joy and rejoicing used in the Old Testament? Just to kind of, and there were three recurring circumstances surrounding experiences of true joy. I saw this pattern emerge in Philippians. It was repeated in the, in the, uh, throughout the New Testament, and it was very evident in the Old Testament. This, uh, this, this pattern emerged in um, the, these three recurring circumstances. Now, these three, it wasn't like joy or rejoicing fell neatly into one of these three categories. They, they were interwoven together, which seemed to strengthen that way of encountering joy that much more. And so... I noticed these three settings in which we can find joy, settings that may surprise you as it did me. Um, if it doesn't surprise you, um, if you could look surprised, that would make me feel better, okay? All right. Three ways to find joy that may surprise you. Meals, suffering, and the future. All throughout Scripture. I don't know if you've ever done a, like a word study. Um, you can, they're a lot easier now that we have so many tools on the internet, but you can pull up a word like joy or rejoicing and you find that and you look at what's going on around it. What's, what's happening? What is God doing? What are the people doing in that moment? And you will see over and over joy is mentioned in the midst of sharing meals, in the midst of suffering, and in the midst of a future focus, looking ahead to what is coming. And so I know right now some of you are thinking, great, let's talk about one and three. This sounds really good. Um, I am fine with two out of, I'm fine with two thirds joy uh, this morning. Let's go with that. I want us to, um, let's walk through each one of these and I'm just gonna pull like one, maybe two references throughout, uh, from scripture on, on these. But if you're looking for a fun um, study, dive into this. Know that um, studying these things doesn't bring you joy though. Okay, studying joy doesn't bring you joy any more than reading a book about swimming is going to help you swim. Okay, and we're going to talk about what you're going to have to do to maintain it, to keep it, to, to really get in there with it. But um, a joy in meals, is there a better weekend for us to talk about joy in meals? I mean, we are a people here in the United States, and if you're from outside this country and you've come in, Thanksgiving wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to you. Um, but for us, a lot, how many of us actually talked about what Thanksgiving was for at our Thanksgiving meal? One, thank you, Annette. All right, two, two, three, okay. When you think of Thanksgiving, what do you think of? Food, yes, it wouldn't be Thanksgiving without the meal. You know, hey, thanks, you know, those of you in history that did all that amazing stuff. I'm here to eat, okay? Pretty much, can you kind of think of every significant gathering we have, there's a food associated with it? I mean, Thanksgiving is turkey. Christmas, you might have a specific food associated with that. Maybe a, an Easter meal. Even July 4th. Barbecue, Barbecue yeah. I mean, there is a birthday. Oh, is that your birthday? Okay. <laughs> 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, a birthday cake for birthdays? Yeah. What is a birthday without something very healthy to eat? <laughs> yeah. There is, there is joy in meals. And as you read through the scriptures, you'll see God was really big into his people celebrating. In fact, if there is a discipline that we probably lack a lot of here in the church, it's celebrating. God encouraged the people over and over, press the pause button and celebrate. And the way I want you to celebrate this is I want you to remember what I've done. I want you to celebrate what I'm continuing to do. And I want you to celebrate how I am a God who is faithful and will continue to do this. And by the way, eat a whole lot of really good food while you do. Over and over. In Leviticus 23, this is the first use of the word rejoice in the Bible. In Leviticus 23, um, the Lord is, is kind of laying out the calendar, the, the yearly calendar for his people Israel. And he's telling them specific times of the year when they are going to celebrate. And this is the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles. This is when they um, would build these temporary dwellings and remember what it was like. And this has carried on. Uh, it carried on for generations afterwards. But they remembered that they were people who wandered, who lived in a temporary dwelling. And, the, and we read in uh, Leviticus 23, 40, this is the first use of the word rejoice. On the first day, you are, you are to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And a little bit earlier in that same chapter, for seven days, present food offerings to the Lord. And on the eighth day, hold a sacred assembly and present a food offering to the Lord. Can you imagine Thanksgiving for eight days? And I don't mean just the leftovers that we have for eight days, okay? Beth, we had turkey and dumplings last night. It was so good, so good. That's just the leftovers. Can you imagine eight days of this is a fresh Thanksgiving meal for lunch, another fresh meal for dinner? I mean, this is, this is a big time. In Nehemiah 8, this is a picture of um, the people that have returned from exile. This, this small number of people have returned from exile. They were in exile because they blew it. They had disobeyed. They were rebellious. If we were to use marriage terms, they were, they were not faithful. And the, the marriage analogy is one that God uses throughout Scripture to describe his relationship to his people. He, he talked about Israel as his bride and how he would make these vows and his, um, his love for them was, was unconditional. And in Nehemiah 8, um, Nehemiah says to the people, in the midst of, the, they, they've just opened up the law, they've had the law read to them, and they are weeping because they realize how they have broken every vow that they made before God. They did, their ancestors did. Nehemiah says to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. When it talks about eating the fat, it's not talking about cutting away the meat and only eating the fat. It's actually talking about find the choicest cut of meat. And I want you to eat just that choice part of the meat. I want this to be the tastiest meal that you have. And I want you to rejoice even in the midst of this, this truth that you have been unfaithful. Now, that had to be weird for them. I kind of want to set the stage. Have you ever um, been to or um, uh, maybe participated in a vow renewal? It's, it's when a, a married couple um, maybe after a certain period of time says we want to renew our vows and it's a way to say man if I could do it again I'd, I'd do it I'd do it all over again uh, maybe you um, have been to a vow renewal that um, a couple walked through a really tough time and they came together and they renewed those vows to say we've been through this tough time but we're, we're together we're staying together we're committed this was almost like a vow renewal that was taking place. The bride, Israel, is standing in this city 
that is desolate and in ruins. It's like they're, they're renewing the vows in the place of their infidelity. How crazy is that? And God looks at them and says, I love you. I'm not going anywhere. Let's do this. You and me. Can you imagine the joy that they had in the midst of all of that brokenness to realize God was not giving up on them. The joy of the Lord became their strength. And they ate and they celebrated. They, I, can you imagine how good that meal tasted? Not just because of the food, but because they knew that God still loved them. The joy of the Lord is their strength. He is the groom that radiates joy. We experience joy in meals as we remember. We remember God's faithfulness. A meal strengthens our body. You've noticed that. It gets rid of that, the hangry that we have. Um, we can go to the table a little weak, but we walk away with more energy. So the meal strengthens our physical body, but it also strengthens the soul with joy as we remember God's faithfulness. God instituted several meals, one of which we're going to close out our service with, that are intended to bring us joy as we partake of that meal because we remember God was faithful. God continues to be faithful, and he will be faithful. Joy in meals. Second one, joy in suffering. You gonna stick around for this one? Okay. Um, Hebrews 12, 2 says this, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So this is one of so many times when joy and suffering are mentioned together. Happened a whole lot in Philippians, which isn't surprising when you realize that the author of that letter wrote it in a time of suffering. Paul, in prison, chained to a Roman prison guard, suffering, sacrificing, talked about joy. <laughs> Patterning his life after Jesus, the founder and perfecter of his faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Now, I gotta admit, this verse made me feel guilty for the longest time. Because I, I remember thinking, okay, so does this mean every time I experience pain, I'm supposed to laugh through it? I'm, I'm just not Jesus-y if I don't feel some kind of joy bubbling up within me in the midst of pain. If I slam my finger in a car door on accident, I don't usually say praise the Lord. I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> That is not joy that's welling up within me, okay? So am I, am I missing the point here? I mean, it's not like Jesus was laughing as they drove the nails through his hands and feet. And I don't think, I'm pretty sure, that this verse is not saying every time we feel pain, whether it's physical or emotional pain, and given the choice of the two, can we agree we'd almost rather endure physical pain than the emotional pain? But this is not saying that when we feel pain that we are supposed to laugh it off and sing some happy joy song and act like nothing happened. When something hurts, you say, ouch, and that's okay. When, when we feel pain, we voice it, and it's okay to take your complaints to God. In fact, God wants us in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our suffering, to take our complaints to him. Get this, he wants to hear our complaints. Is that not the craziest thing? He says that several times in the Psalms. Bring your complaints to me. So what's he talking about here? What is this joy and pain? Um, our house, I don't know that our house is filled with any more or less laughter than yours. But there is one time when 
um, a recurring time when our joy um, kind of hits peak moments. Um, my wife, Beth, um, can eat hot food and it doesn't phase her, whether it's temperature hot or spicy hot. Um, I have to blow on a bowl of soup for like three hours <laughs> before I can take my first little sip. No lie, I'll be like on my third spoonful, her bowl is empty, you know, and she's just looking at me, shaking her head, you know. Sometimes I forget to blow on my food, I'm, whatever, I'm too hungry, I just forget what happened the night before, and I'll put a giant spoonful of scalding something in my mouth, and then I'm scrambling for ice water or something, or I'm, I'm doing that, <gasps> you ever try to do that where you're trying to blow on your food while it's in your mouth, you know? When this happens, my wife starts laughing so hard. I mean, like she thinks this is the funniest thing when I burn my mouth. My suffering brings her joy. <laughs> Recently, um, Beth wasn't there. I'm eating something with the kids. I put a mouthful of something hot and I eat a mouthful of something and I spit it out because it was so hot. And Callie looks over and goes, bummer, mom wasn't here to enjoy that. <laughs> <laughs> Spicy hot. We, we did a trip to the Holy Land and, and included with that was this trip to Amman, Jordan. And we're at this restaurant and I bit into something. I have no idea what it was, but it lit me up. Tears. I lost my voice. I'm having a hard time breathing. I'm, I'm kind of wondering, am I going to die? Beth is crying, laughing so hard. I'm trying to ask for help. She can't get help because she's laughing too hard, okay? There's other people at her table. They're laughing at her laughing at me and my suffering. This is what's going on. This is what I go through at home, people. <laughs> Joy is not found in watching other people suffer, okay? We know that, right? Um, and the joy that comes from suffering is not a joy for the suffering. Let's be really clear on that. It's a joy for the benefits of enduring and sticking with that suffering and pain because of what it's gonna produce. James 1, consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. There's a joy in suffering because you know that on the other side of that is something that you would never know or experience or have. And you cling to that hope. Um, Hebrews 12, 2 could also mean um, because of the joy that was set before him. In other words, let me, let me read Hebrews 12, 2 again from the message translation, which was uh, by Eugene Peterson. Because he, Jesus, never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God, he could put up with anything along the way cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. Do you see what powered him through that suffering? And then verse three, when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, go over that same story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through, that will shoot adrenaline into your souls. I love that picture. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. That's like the, the joy is an adrenaline, isn't it? We see what Jesus endured, and we receive the joy for that. I know so many of you are making sacrifices right now. I'm privileged to hear you as you share your stories 
as you share some of the painful things that you're going through in life, um, a lot of pressure. You're, you're by yourself trying to provide for your kids in a really tough spot. Maybe you're in a new season where you're caring for aging parents or grandparents. You're pressing through chronic pain. I could go on and on. You're just dealing with, with life at its worst right now. Um, I'm amazed at what you have been through in life, but it's not left you embittered. There are some of you that are pressing through and what I see instead of a callousness or a numbness, what I see in you is a strength and a grace. And when I see what you are enduring and how you are enduring it, it shoots adrenaline into my soul. It shoots adrenaline. It, it fills me with joy. It brings me to a point where I can see, hey, you know what I'm going through right now? I'm going to make it. You, you've set the pace for me in that way. And it's not that you're rejoicing for the pain. Certainly not that. But as you suffer through it, you do so with a future forward perspective. And that's where you're finding your joy on the other side of this. And again, like I said, these three ways that we find joy aren't, they don't fit neatly into one of these components. They are interwoven together. And this suffering is oftentimes closely linked to this future joy. And so let's talk about that. Um, I mentioned to you the first time that rejoice is mentioned in the Bible. It was back in Leviticus. Um, how about the last time that rejoicing is mentioned? It's in the book of Revelation. And it describes a meal, actually. And this is given to us in a way that we can kind of look forward to this. We will experience this joy someday, and it combines the meal again. Listen to this in Revelation 19. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder shouting hallelujah for our Lord God almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Then the angel said to me, write the following, blessed are those who are invited to the banquet at the wedding celebration of the lamb. The Bible promises a day when we will ultimately and forever be delivered from the pains and the difficulties and diseases of this life. There will be no more hunger, no more poverty, no more tears, no more death, just joy, unending, unfading joy. That is our future in Christ. And this is one of those times when rejoicing comes full circle because we will see that any suffering that we endured was worth it. In the end, the, fu the, for the future forward focus is key and we are going to have a meal to end all meals and we will rejoice. This is what we have to look forward to. Three ways may be surprising to you to find joy. One simple way to keep joy, give thanks. Simple way to, to keep joy is by giving thanks. I just wanna remind you, I am, I am preaching loudest at myself right now, okay? These are, these are things, I, I needed to hear this message more than anybody. Um, I read this quote earlier, and in fact, I think I sent this as a, a link to our life group leaders. This is a quote um, by a novelist, Morris West. At a certain age, our lives simplify, and we need have only three phrases left in our spiritual vocabulary. We get to this certain point where we have three phrases that really cover everything in our spiritual vocabulary. You want to know what they are? You can write them down if you want, but I think you'll be able to remember them. Phrase number one, thank you. Phrase number two, thank you. Phrase number three, you're welcome. <laughs> we grow to a point where no matter what happens, because of 
this fuller understanding of joy and what Christ has done and what is offered to us, our response can be, thank you. How crazy is that? I want that life. Now, where I would wrestle with the truth of his comment, it begins by saying, at a certain age, our lives simplify. Unfortunately, this isn't something that just happens chronologically. It isn't like by a certain um, age of 30, 50, 80, 100 that we get to that point. But it's actually, as we mature in Christ, it can appear more and more frequently. And it's funny how we might be tempted to gauge Christian maturity, um, you know, by education, by Bible knowledge, by length of time attending church, by whether or not you're still awake in church, things like that. But cultivating this heart of gratitude is not done in a seminary classroom. So don't, don't use a lack of education as an excuse for this. Cultivating a heart of gratitude is not found through that perfect six-week study or because the worship set finally combined the right songs with the volume you prefer. I said this earlier, when we look for joy, it's often a search for something we don't have. When we give thanks, we recognize what we already have. When we give thanks, we recognize what we already have. So what are we giving thanks for? Could it be as simple as choosing to give thanks for the ways that we found joy in meals and suffering and in the future that we have? When we have found joy in those three ways, we keep joy by saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna ask our worship team to come up um, some people find it surprising to learn that in the early church, a baptism was actually a very somber event, and communion was really loud and celebratory, as in like party like it's 1999, okay? And, and we, we've kind of reversed that. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but for today... With the spirit of joy, I want us to celebrate communion. Will you consider doing that with me? Now, I'm not saying you've got to stand up and shout when you receive the elements, but maybe you will partake of communion with the biggest smile you've had all week. Why not give God your biggest smile as you partake in communion? Or maybe after you partake in communion, and you remember through this meal the joy that you have and the joy that you will have forever. As we sing that closing song, maybe you'll sing louder than you've ever sang before because you realize there is a joy you can celebrate right now. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads. Lord God, in you is fullness of joy. As we share in communion, open our eyes to see a combination of all three aspects of joy. How this food and drink represent your son's holy suffering. And that this is a foretaste of the great wedding feast in the future. And for this, we say thank you. Amen.